Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation, keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. Kevin is a retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel who has studied UFOs for more than 50 years. His military training has provided him with unique insight into military operations and UFO research. Kevin has investigated many of the most mysterious cases and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries and been interviewed on hundreds of radio and television programs about UFOs. Considered to be one of the leading experts on the Roswell UFO crash, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs including Roswell in the 21st Century and Encounter in the Desert, a re-examination of the Socorro UFO landing. Now here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. Wow, that's some kind of introduction. Well, welcome to this edition of A Different Perspective. I am Kevin Randall. I'll be joined in just a moment by Mike Rogers. He of uh, Travis Walton abduction fame. Before we started, I wanted to make a couple of comments here. I normally don't turn on the television very early in the morning, but today I did, and I caught a program called Contact, which was on the Discovery Channel, I think. They were discussing the Rhodes photograph, and I'm very familiar with that case. Uh, William Rhodes was a uh, scientist, researcher, who lived in Phoenix, Arizona in July of 1947, took two pictures of uh, an object over overhead. Uh, pictures have been in the newspaper. I've written about it several times. You can find it on my blog if you want to take a look at that sort of thing. I bring this up for one thing. They mentioned that the FBI had confiscated his pictures. That's untrue. Back in 1947, when... The investigation began. He was interviewed by a guy from the uh, counterintelligence corps of the army who was accompanied by an FBI guy who didn't want to be identified as FBI. So it was just another government agent. The point is, um, Rhodes gave up the pictures voluntarily to the military for their research, was told at the time he may not get them back given the way things were going. And he didn't care about that in 1947. In 1952, when the Washington Nationals began, those were the sightings over Washington, D.C. in July of 1947, he began a campaign to get his pictures back. And there was some trouble about that. They had lost them or they didn't know where they were and that sort of thing, which I don't find very difficult to believe given the way the UFO investigation had been handled from 1947 to 1952. So I just wanted to clarify that point that uh, 
Although it's been said many times that his photographs were confiscated, they were not. Now let's move on to Mike Rogers. Now normally when I do these programs, I either find a biography of the uh, guest online or on a book or something like that. Um, Paul Davids, who will be on in a couple of weeks, sent me a bio that just literally went for pages. I just had to really edit it down. Mike Rogers was very succinct in his uh, bio that he sent me. He just told me that uh, he has worked in logging much of his life, even summers when he went to school. When he was 28, he had his own crew, and in 1975, he and a six-man crew, of which Travis Walton was a sawyer, a sawyer, a sawyer, a sawyer. A year after that, a well-known UFO encounter and Walton's apparent abduction, Mike started working with his father again, then went back to school for a time. In 1997, he was a witness to the Phoenix Lights, so he's had some uh, encounters with UFOs. When he was uh, standing on a hill in Prescott, Arizona, before and after the lights, he uh, operated a domestic tree service business, which uh, did very well. Ever since witnessing the Phoenix Lights, he has conducted his own very thorough 22-year in-depth investigation into the lights, discovering numerous never-before-known realities. Two years ago, he started speaking of these revelations. Some are quite disturbing, even to hardened skeptics. His scientific abstract was published in the May issue of the MUFON Journal, endorsed by astronomer Hal Provenmeyer. And I think he's a very accomplished artist, if I remember correctly. He's got some very stunning paintings about uh, Walton's abduction and that sort of thing. Mike Rogers, welcome to A Different Perspective. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's uh, an interesting uh, a bio that you've got there. I am right about the artistic uh, uh, endeavors, aren't I? Well, yeah, I, I don't push that a lot. Uh, I'm a fairly accomplished artist, but uh, uh, I don't do an awful lot of it, basically just for my own personal needs. Uh, I've been offered jobs doing that. Uh, some public, uh, publications uh, have, have offered me jobs, but uh, basically just, for myself and whatever I'm trying to do at the time. I, so I've illustrated a lot concerning the Phoenix Lights. And, of course, I illustrated Travis's two books, uh, The Walton Experience and then Fire in the Sky. Um, so that's the extent of my uh, artistic uh, doings. <laughs> well, I, I have to say the, the, the paintings that I have seen are, are very, very good. So uh, very talented man in that respect. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, let's let's move on to UFOs now, since that's the topic. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you were part of the crew, or you were leading the crew, when Travis Walton was abducted. Uh, give us, uh, I guess, the thumbnail sketch of what transpired. A thumbnail sketch? Well... Or do it as quickly <laughs> as you can <laughs> yeah. to get it all... I understand it's very complicated. Well, it's actually fairly simple. I know how to do your thumbnail sketch. Uh, uh, we we were a crew. I, I was crew a crew boss on a, a six man crew, so there's seven of us all together, and uh, we finished work, and we're headed out. Uh, we worked until till dark actually, and uh, by the time we had everything loaded up and on our way, it was uh, dark, and. Uh, I hadn't gone very far down the road, and, and we saw light coming through the trees, and and uh, the guys started getting excited, and not at first, but uh, were, were very puzzled about what we were seeing. And uh, as we broke into this clearing and could actually see it clearly, uh, I looked over. Travis was already out the door. <laughs> uh, he uh, he took off kind of in a very fast walk and then slowed down as he got closer to it. It was actually only about 100 feet away from the road and, and kind of up a uphill a bit. So I couldn't even see what they were looking at. And uh, Travis was standing up there. Well, I, I turned the truck off and leaned over and looked up that way, and I was very amazed at what I saw. The first time in my life I'd really seen anything that close. In my life, I've seen things far off, uh, sometimes with people, sometimes without people, but nothing that close. And um, I was just... What did uh, it look like? What did it look like? 
Well, it looks like the illustrations that I've done, but uh, it's uh, it was a, a disc-shaped object. It was like two pie pans put lip to lip, and with a what looked appear like a dome. Like I said, this thing was up 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 above the ground, and it was the ground that it was above was up up the hill away, thirty or forty feet above our position, and uh, so what was on top just from where I was, was just kind of an essence of a dome. Uh, that's what it looked like, but it was it was segmented. It had uh, a framework like, uh, and it was fairly simple looking, but at the same time, it was very very striking. It was uh, some of the guys were described like a, it looked like a brand new Corvette, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know like like that in terms of what it looked like, the way it affected us. It had a beauty like that. And it looked mechanical, and it was just sitting there perfectly still at first. And within a few seconds, uh, it started moving. And it also started making louder sounds. I didn't hear anything right at first, but after a while, there was kind of a rumble that came through that I could feel. My hands were still on the steering wheel, and I could feel it through that. And uh, then everybody there got real excited, and some of the guys were yelling at Travis. Well, actually, all of us were yelling at him. To get back and so he's uh, still he's still walking up the hill toward the object no by this time he's already there he's he's oh. standing there uh he might have got directly underneath it maybe uh, but there was this uh, brush pile uh a large brush pile of uh, logging debris that was there and he and he uh stood there just in front of it and looking up at it and uh he wasn't directly underneath but he looked back at us uh, once or twice, and he looked like he was kind of uncertain about what he was doing at this point. But uh, as this thing got louder and uh, started moving more, yeah, I could tell that he was deciding that what he was doing wasn't necessarily so smart. And uh, and he crouched down, uh, kind of like a, behind a log that was sticking out of that pile. And... Uh, he was there for a while. He looked back this way and, and, uh, you know, like I said, I'd already turned the truck off so that I could bend over and look up at it. And, uh, when, when he did that, uh, he just within seconds, he, he stood back up and turned as, as if to come back to the truck. And it's very powerful, extremely bright, a bolt of light or energy or something hit him directly in the head, more or less the chest area, and just blew him back and up as if he was uh, somebody had thrown a, a bomb or grenade or something right in front of him. And uh, he flew back through the air, but you could tell that he was just unconscious at that point because he hit the ground without even trying to protect his fall. And, well, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to interrupt you here because we're going to have to take a short break. Okay. I'm talking with Mike Rogers, who was with Travis Walton during his abduction in 1975. I'll have more information up on my blog at www.kevinrandall.com, kevinrandall.blogspot.com when we get a chance. My mind wanders sometimes. I do not know why. Um, I will be back with Mike Rogers right after this, so stick around. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by shaman worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, 
international long-distance shamanic healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. I am here with Mike Rogers. We're talking about the Travis Walton abduction, and he was a part of it, sort of, I guess. When we went away, uh, Travis had just been hit by the beam of light and had fallen unconscious to the ground. So what did you do at that point, Mike? Well, I panicked. But (laughs) it wasn't like as if I didn't have plenty of help in that. Uh, everybody in the truck, the other five guys, uh, were all yelling at me. And uh, I could distinctly hear people saying, get the hell out of here. And, uh, and of course, I didn't need any prompting. Uh, I hit the gas. I had to turn the truck on first, but I hit the gas just as soon as it started. And I tore off down that road. And, and um, I mean, very fast. And this was a bad road. Uh bad road uh it it really wasn't a road it was a logging trail and it had been closed by uh, bulldozers so they humped these big piles of dirt up every hundred yards or so so uh it became a rather uh terrifying flight uh well if you don't mind if you don't mind me saying so my third first thought was your your pal has been injured by something and you guys take off and I'm thinking, why would you do that? And, and I and then I think then I'm thinking, well, you're you're panicked because you've just seen something you you didn't expect. And I realized, as uh, a former Army helicopter pilot, our instinct would have been rushed forward to to help our pal. But um, you guys weren't trained military; you were no, loggers. You we were weren't. loggers, and 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 uh, presented what? with something that just. Yeah. Out of the ordinary, it had to catch you. So, so you've taken off. You've left Travis behind, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, started thinking pretty soon, much sooner than the other guys there would like, would have liked, because I hit, I hit the brakes about a quarter of a mile up the road, and it didn't take very, very long to get a quarter of a mile up the road, uh, and they were already just. If they weren't afraid of what had just happened, which they, of course, were, uh, that flight down that road would have scared the hell out of anybody. It scared me, but uh, I hit the brakes because I was, by that time I realized that I had panicked and I had left, and and I my instinct was to go back because obviously I'm thinking about what I'd done and uh, what happened to Travis, and uh, we saw him hit the ground. So, so you know, stopping the truck. Just within a, a half a minute or so, I get out of the truck after arguing with these guys. They're yelling at me, you know. So what, you've driven bro- you've driven back up to the point that you had been before. Uh, you've, no, you've, not yet. Not okay. yet. I we got out of the truck. As we were getting out of the truck, uh, I looked back in that direction, and I I saw a light. Uh, you couldn't see it distinctly because you're looking through a lot of trees and foliage there quarter of a mile away, but I saw a light rise up and streak off towards the uh, north northeast and uh, and disappear very quickly. It was just a streak, and, and uh, but I was fairly confident that whatever it was had left. And uh, I, I, I don't know how many of the other guys saw that. Uh, I think one of the other guys said that they saw that, but the other guys didn't. And uh, 
everybody got out and we went around in front of the truck in, in front of the headlights <laughs> and uh everybody was just it was just complete turmoil we argued there and stuff and then pretty soon uh i told them you know we're going back and it wasn't very long until we did go back but unlike the movie fire in the sky which has me going back by myself they all decided to go back in spite of their fear and everything else uh, they decided to go back rather than stand there in the dark by the side of the road and so we all went back and when we got back to the spot they but you dro- got- you drove back you got back in the truck and drove back to the spot yes okay. and uh, after doing that uh, i i pulled the the truck up in the clearing uh where the light shined pretty much on the spot where travis had been and uh he wasn't there and uh, the object was already gone which i knew but he wasn't there we didn't immediately think that they had taken him so uh we got all got out and i got out because we had a flashlight and ken peterson got out with me and the other guys just like getting back in the truck to go back they all got out too and uh kind of arm in arm shoulder to shoulder anyway uh, we conducted a search up there, and uh, the search got wider and wider until we were out going around through the trees out in the outlined areas of the, you know, beyond the, the clearing. And I don't know, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes worth of searching. And uh, it just finally got to me. And I kind of broke down. So so you're you're saying that uh, during the search you, you uh, couldn't find Travis – You've spent some time looking for him with the flashlights, walking around, and yeah. you've decided that uh, maybe it's time to go call the police or go get some help. Right. Uh, we 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 went back. We went back to Heber, which is uh, I don't know, twelve miles or so from from where we were working. And uh, on the way back, uh, everybody just talked and talked and talked and, and yelled and cried. Some of the guys were crying. And and it, it was pretty rough on us. I mean, very emotional. I mean, but, well, you've just you've just lost your friend. You don't know what happened to him. He's disappeared. Right. And, uh, uh, did, and you, uh, did, did you think it. in terms of abduction at that time, or what did, did did you have any idea what if might have happened to him? What might have happened to him? Well, I I didn't think that he had been abducted. I didn't even know about that sort of thing. Really, I I thought that he had just wandered off. Of course, there were no footprints. We couldn't find any footprints. And, and of course, everything was kind of covered with pine needles, but because there had been cats in there pushing up brush. Uh, By cats, you mean bulldozers and stuff. Right, yeah. Uh, some of the ground was bare, and enough of it that surely we would have found footprints, but we couldn't find footprints. In fact, the only footprints we found was from where, the, where we stopped the truck. Up through the clearing, that 100 feet or so, to uh, where he had been standing. Uh, We didn't see any marks where he had landed. Of course, I know he'd landed flat on his back, so that wouldn't really present too much. And, and of course, there were pine needles where he had hit the ground. So you've gone into Heber now. um, Yeah. And you're looking for the the sheriff or the, the police? Well, Ken Peterson is the one that called. I was... I couldn't hardly talk at that point. Uh, Ken Peterson just kind of took it upon himself to to go make the call, and we parked right there by a phone booth, and he did, and he called, but he didn't tell them about an abduction. He didn't say anything about a UFO. Uh, I talked to him about that after he got back in the truck, and and uh, we waited there for a little while. It didn't take very long, and the, the uh, undersheriff or the town policeman, whatever he was, uh, I think his name was uh, Ellison, came and uh, and talked to us. And, and we did, still didn't say much to him, but uh, Ken finally told them that uh, we had seen a UFO and, and, and that he thought that we thought maybe ha- that had something to do with him being uh, missing. But You mean Travis be, had something to do with Travis being missing? The, the UFO yeah, had yeah. something to do with it? it. Yes. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, it it was about a half hour or so later that the sheriff of Navajo County showed up, and I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, 
why the sheriff, but later on I found out it was because he was personally interested in, in that because he had had a UFO experience himself sometime before that. And uh, that was why. But so he, the, won't, the, he won't admit the, that on TV or anything. <laughs> the the uh, law enforcement reaction then was not one that you guys have been drinking too much or smoking too much, but they, they treated it as a, something that was very serious. Yeah, well, they certainly checked our truck. I mean, they looked all over for, for whatever, and I, they even made that comment, you guys been drinking, and, and of course, we all, heavens no, you know. <laughs> Just two beers. <laughs> <laughs> no, none. We, in fact, most of us didn't drink. Now, a couple of those guys did. Travis and I and uh, uh, Ken Peterson did not. Uh, we were total abstainers, but... Uh, Several of the other guys did, you know. In fact, one of the guys there, uh, Alan Dallas, was uh, was kind of a drug user. I, I know he smoked pot, you know. Other than so that, did, I, but the the sheriff did the sheriff initiate a search at that point, or what did he do? Well, he listened to our story, and uh, you know, in the movie and other things, uh, TV shows and whatever, they they have me saying uh, they took him. <laughs> I never said that. I said, we don't know what happened to him. You know, he probably wandered off. We need to go find find out what happened. Uh, and uh, Sheriff Gillespie took that serious, and so they did that. And unlike the movie, they actually went out, uh, Ken Copeland, his undersheriff, and him, and three of us, uh, uh, three of the guys stayed there, and uh, three of us went up the hill and searched, and... Uh, we conducted a fairly good search that night, at least on the roads. It was at night, but they had flashlights, so they had a, a thing on their truck. They had a four-wheel drive, for one thing, and uh, couldn't find a thing. Uh, they searched thoroughly on the roads and everything else for footprints, but there wasn't anything. And uh, the sheriff said, well, we, we can't do anything more tonight, but we'll we'll have a search tomorrow. So... That's let me happened. stop you. Let me stop you right there because I'm I'm getting up against my break time once again. Okay. And uh, when we come back, we'll uh, talk about how the uh, uh, APRO Aero Phenomena Research Organization and Jim Lorenzen got involved in that sort of thing and how quickly that happened after the events. Uh, once again, take a look at the blog www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, where I'll have uh, additional information or links to other places like that. I'm here with Mike Rogers and we will be back right after this so stick around. Shamanic Art School proudly presents the Gathering of Shaman 2019 Fall Retreat, Manifestation Salon. Join me, Certified Shamanic Instructor Gwilda Wiecka, in the magnificent Colorado Mountains this November 2nd and 3rd for a life-changing event. Participate in unique teachings and ceremonies that will put the power and magic of shamanic manifestation into your hands. Sit in circle with like-minded individuals, sharing group energy and the power it generates. Classes will be held in a facility next to the beautiful, majestic Arkansas River further empowering the experience. Space is limited, so reserve your spot today. For more information, visit findyourpathhome.com or email touchin at findyourpathhome.com. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, Join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, Psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. 
With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com, or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www. TV.com or www.xzonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation, keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. I'm with Mike Rogers. We're talking Phoenix Lights here. And uh, we're, again, running out of time. I can't believe how quickly these hours pass. I had uh, actually two questions for you, for you, Mike. First of all, you said that you had been out there on the hill near Prescott with a professional quality camera. Did you get any photographic evidence? Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, in order to get a, an image, it had to be so computer enhanced that it is truly... Um, well, it, it's not a real image, but I, I did get an essence of it, yes. So there, there is an image, but it could be argued it was basically computer-generated because of... Uh... Well, yeah, if you go into the, in the, all the yes and no's and all that stuff and all the regulations concerning, it, it was uh, what they call it, photoshopped. <laughs> okay. And the second, I mean, te- technically, yes. And the second question is, what do you think you saw if it's not extraterrestrial? Well, I still don't know, but I say, and I have speculated about this myself and gone into depth about it, that could have been made uh, relatively, well, it still would have cost several thousand dollars, as, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter who did it. Uh, I, I think that it had something to do with the Air Force and the government because it looks to be very much to be something that was deliberate and for the purpose of getting public reaction. Did, and as we all know, the government likes to do that. Did um, I, you know? I, I, I'm trying to visualize the, the ge- geology, uh, not geology, the, the, the geography of the situation here. Yeah, could it have been something that came from Area 51? Well, not according to eyewitness uh, testimony. See, nobody okay. saw it. Nobody saw it over over Nevada. Nobody saw it anywhere in Nevada except for these four witnesses. And in Boulder saw- City, which is right at the very tip of Nevada, and you, it, it, yes, just, and you uh, cross the bridge and you're in Arizona. Right, but you see, I've gone there several times to investigate what how they could see that 160 miles away. Well, first of all, the sky was very clear. Uh, you could see that 160 miles easily. I mean, you can see hundreds, thousands of miles into space quite clearly. But uh, they all saw it leaving, and the object was actually uh, a third of a mile wide or wider. And the people in Nevada all said that it was the size of a 747 or the size of a, a B-2 bomber, which is uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 times smaller than the, than the size of the object actually was, which automatically, in their particular perspective, put it 12 times closer. And because of that, they thought it was right there in Nevada. Would it, it be... Would it be fair to suggest that you had seen some kind of maybe a balloon type um, object in a in a in that uh, chevron shape that was, as you say, mm-hmm. sent over to see what people's reactions would be? Well, my near near conclusion is that it was uh, lifted by lighter than air substance, uh, pop, probably helium. And uh, it was carried on the wind because it went exactly in precise line with, with the wind in direction, elevation, and speed. I'm assuming you looked at the winds aloft data. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got the, all that. Because the winds at the surface are 
always, well, not always, but many times significantly different than the winds at altitude. Actually, in this particular case, the surface winds and the high altitude winds were the same. Okay. This, yeah, this was the time of year when the winds in Arizona are, are at their highest. And I also believe that plays into this government project thing, you know, trying to see what people are going to think of it, because they seem to be picking the worst day of the year uh, for wind. <laughs> and there's another thing that's very, very strange. The wind usually comes out of the southwest in Arizona, both the surface and the high altitude wind. But in this particular case, there was this thing that, where the wind just went whew, right down over Arizona going south and then bent back and then rejoined the jet stream, the low jet stream, uh, towards towards the east. And that is very unusual. It's almost as if that bubble was created on purpose. Uh, you've said that you've published a great deal about this. Well, I've written a great deal about it, yeah. It I can... have it all lined down into 27 pages that I have available, you know, on, on my, uh, over the, over the, through the net. And and how, how could we access that? Oh, I have a, a site. Uh, it's not a site, actually. It's just my email. It's uh, mhrogers700 at uh, yahoo.com. And uh, I, I'll send, you know, virtual, of course, uh, the whole thing, but the 27 pages anyway, which has an awful lot of illustrations in it. So we can link, we can link to that to the, um, to the internet so we can analyze your analysis. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, you and, also said, you said one other thing, and, and we're getting up to the end of the program, <clears throat> uh, about evidence. Uh, I think there's a great deal of evidence suggesting an extraterrestrial presence and and it, it in the form of, of photographic evidence, radar traces, landing traces, interaction with the environment, <clears throat> uh, gun camera films, uh, military pilots experiences and that sort of thing. But now you're talking about in general, right? Not about the first event of the Phoenix Lights. I'm talking about in general. So when you made the comment, you're talking about specifically the first event then. Yes. <clears throat> and not not about UFOs in general. So we're we're kind of on the same page there that there's some very interesting evidence. Yes. As of today, there's an awful lot of evidence. Fox has been releasing this thing they call a Tic Tac and and other stuff, uh, you know, gun camera uh, sightings and other personal uh, video of uh just now released just within the last year, uh things that are in fact, I think it's kind of uh, the government's way of introducing disclosure without having to take the flack. <laughs> but it's certainly making a lot of uh, proof, uh, well, heavy evidence anyway, for extraterrestrial. But uh, I guess the, th the thing that bothers me about all of this is we kind of reject the government's explanation for many, many sightings because they're frankly idiotic. And yet we accept it when they are saying this is this is really strange. This is extraterrestrial. This is alien. Um, does that kind of bother you at all that we we massage the evidence to, or the information to go where we want it to go? Yes, and and uh, that's very <laughs> deep, very deep. Uh, but uh, I think that the government is coming forward now with a form of disclosure. Okay, so when we get back to the Phoenix Lights, then. Your theory, your belief is that the there was an event that involved some kind of unidentified craft, but you believe this unidentified craft was terrestrially manufactured. It would be what I guess we would call a unidentified aerial phenomenon as opposed to an unidentified flying object. Yes. And that the majority of the interest in the Phoenix Lights was generated by flares and other activities going on over Phoenix on March 13th, 1997 that, that had nothing to do with that first event that we talked about. Right. The first event of the Phoenix Lights is still a mystery. Nobody has explained it, and the skeptics certainly haven't explained it, and uh, that's where it sets. <clears throat> and you do have, well, you do have uh, an illustration, and I guess we can look at your, uh, at your documentation uh, um, about your findings, uh, you also you also mentioned in in the in the bio that it was in the May issue of the Mufon Journal. Is that May of this year? Yes. Yeah, four months ago. 
and so that uh, if people are members of MUFON, they can go back to their the journal and take a look at it. Is there anything on the MUFON website about this? Uh, just just that abstract, and and it's kind of hidden because it's in a, in another article done by Thomas Keller, which. Uh, uh, talks about other strange things that, in my opinion, are just completely off the wall. But uh, it's hidden within there. Uh, and it, It's in letters to the editor. Uh, and it's just uh, just the scientific abstract that I did with Hal Pavenmeyer. You mis- mispronounced his name. Uh, every, time I, every time I said it, I mispronounced it. So yes. I, I cop to that because I'm good at mispronouncing names. Anyway, <laughs> ask anybody. Okay. So, you go. I'll take your word for it. Uh, Mike? My- we're right up against the end here. I think we've had a couple of good discussions when we when we figure in the um, Walton abduction and the Phoenix Light store s- stuff as well. I thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us here on A Different Perspective. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I'm sure we'll be in touch or in communication here in the near future. Uh, anybody wants more information, um, we've... we've I'll have a link up on my uh, blog uh, to get you to that information and some illustrations as well. And the blog, of course, is uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And uh, I'll take a moment here to point out that I have done a number of UFO books. And I think that uh, one of the things that bugs me about uh, the way things are today, and I'm going off topic here a little bit, is there are reviews of some of the stuff, of my stuff. And I know that people haven't read the book. And I know because of the way the reviews are written. And I just think that is wrong. You know, one guy wrote on on uh, Roswell in the 21st century. His whole review was, this book is nonsense because there are no aliens. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, if you'd read the book, you wouldn't have made that comment because of the conclusions drawn at the end of the book. You would have understood what I was talking about. Uh, I, I don't understand that, but I think that we see in today's world way too much of people paying attention to things that appear on Twitter and on Facebook by people who have little or no expertise in what they're talking about. They're just angry about something and feel the need to comment on it. And uh, I think that's driving things in the wrong direction. I, I just make that comment because it's something that moves me periodically, and I think I should do that. Uh, next time, I will be joined by... Nick Redfern talking about his book. Uh, the week after that, I'll be joined by Paul Davids, who was the co executive producer of the Roswell movie on Showtime and many, many other things. And he has some very interesting stories to tell you. There are some very interesting um, programs on the X Zone Broadcast Net- Network. That's xzbn.net or what is xzbn.net if you're in Canada. I will be back in uh, 167 hours and look forward to uh, discussing UFOs with you at that time. So thanks for listening. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? 
The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Mike Rogers and I are talking about the Walton abduction, and we've gotten to the point where they had done some lie detector tests, and apparently they, the test proved that they hadn't murdered Travis. And uh, we're going to get APRO involved in this thing now, I guess. So um, how, did Tra- how, did, how did APRO get involved? How, what, what brought them into this? Well, because it uh, became international news, uh, Actually, before uh, we had those lie detector tests, uh, I don't know exactly when that happened, but, uh, you know, I turned on the news on the TV and there it was. uh, And it it began gained fervor very quickly internationally. So so you're saying you're saying the news reports that came out of this because naturally somebody disappearing would be news and the search would be news. But it was linked to a UFO at that point in the in the uh, the first uh, news stories. That's right. Okay, and, so uh, April, April learned about it through the through the media then. I believe that's what happened. Yeah. And then I you did. all go ahead. Uh, you all met with uh, Jim and Cor Lorenzen of April. Yes. Uh, you know they they had a couple of days with him first. Like I was saying before, I I didn't actually see him uh, for about three days, uh, and they were kind of past all that by that time. And of course, he eventually came back up home, up the hill, and uh, that's when we were really able to talk about it. And you know, Apro, as far as Jim and Coral Lorenzen are concerned, uh, I don't know. A week or so later, uh, they invited us down to have dinner with them because they wanted a more personal, personal talk and everything. Well, let's let's point out, Apro headquarters was in Tucson, Arizona, so it wasn't all exactly. that far away from where you you lived. Right. Yeah, just uh, a four-hour drive, I think. And uh, we did have dinner. You know, and I kind of hurt her feelings because uh, she was big on uh, animal cruelty, right? Uh, she was kind of an activist in that. And uh, we were sitting there having a steak dinner, and uh, I made a comment about, uh, you know, I don't believe this. You you don't think a dog should or cat should be hurt at all, but here we are eating steak. Isn't that kind of contrary? And she took that kind of offensively. <laughs> that was the last time I ever went down to Tucson. <laughs> 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 but so, anyway, so when you were a younger man, you weren't necessarily the most diplomatic person around. No, I wasn't that diplomatic. <laughs> I was pretty well. I still am quite straightforward. <laughs> uh, you know, I've uh, you know we you and I've been a couple of shows together. That one was three hours long, and I got kind of direct with you. But you're like me. You're, you know, you're not really too biased, and uh, therefore you can't be easily insulted. You know, <laughs> so. You know, even though I've kind of attacked you in certain ways, uh, we're we're an awful lot alike in our thinking. And well, I so, think it's, I, I, so you're having dinner with the Lorenzens, of course, and uh, discussing the case. Uh, what were their reactions like? I mean, I, I, well, I know Coral and Jim, and I know what their attitudes were, but what were the reactions to you and Travis and, and the boys? Well, other than what I said about her. 
<laughs> cats and dogs thing, you know. Uh, it, was, it was quite cordial, and uh, uh, we were there for an, a long, long time. We talked it out. And, of course, they're totally believing. Uh, I thought that was comforting at that time. Lately, I don't think that sort of attitude is very comforting. You know? <laughs> it seems too heavy, you know, uh, too much bias. But uh, anyway... Well, so there was a there was a Travis took the lie detector test after he came back talking about the UFOs. And there was a big controversy about that because Philip Class, the great UFO debunker, learned about that. And he uh, thought that Travis failed. the Well, he failed the test. And well, uh, yeah, that was bias from the side of the skeptics, just like there's heavy bias on the side of the believers. But this was this was not the same guy that gave you the lie detector test. No, no, no. We, the one we had uh, was Cy Gilson. He was a state uh, employee, uh, hired. Well, at least I think he was contracting, basically, but he was th through the state. And uh, the guy that did a test, first test on Travis, his name was McCarthy. And he was, uh, he didn't believe in UFOs. And the, the treatment he did on Travis kind of bore that out. And, of course, Travis was telling the truth that you can tell that. Uh, and, and since then, Travis has taken several lie detector tests and, and passed them. Uh, one he took with Cy Gilson, finally in 93, that was actually because of a skeptic by the name of Jerry Black, uh, who had challenged me first. And then I took it to Travis and, and, uh, uh, Paramount, who did the movie, didn't, didn't want us to do that at all. They, they came down heavy on me on that, on that no don't do that don't do that because you're talking a month before the movie was to come out and they had put 20 million dollars into that movie and uh it was ready to go and uh they thought we were going to ruin it uh, by failing were, the test by yeah by, the test. by possibly failing the test yes so and i said no that isn't going to happen i says travis telling the truth i'm telling the truth and they and they of course uh jerry black wanted uh, uh the, the guy who was inconclusive you know, to take another test. And so we did, the three of us. And they were very thorough and they were very complete. And we all three of us uh, passed that test to the highest degree. And uh, so, you know, that was uh, that was then. Since then, I think Travis has taken one since then. But, uh, you know, I've only taken two tests in my entire life. And both of them were Cy Gilson. And Cy Gilson started out as a disbeliever. All he could tell the, the sheriff at the time uh, back in 1975 was that, hey, they all passed the test on on, on all the questions, which, you know, floored the, scout, the uh, sheriff, like, like I said. But uh, in, uh, in 93, uh, one month before the movie came out, uh, we passed and we passed through all, all the way across all of us. And uh, Paramount then had a big hooray, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they were very, very relieved at that point. And uh, so, you know, and then, of course, the night of the uh, the night the movie premiered, we were on uh, Larry King Live with Philip Class <laughs> on the opposite side, you know, and uh, I had special words for him <laughs> and him and I sort of got into it. Uh, but, uh, you know, he proved to me that that he was just full of it. And uh, and I, I think we pretty well put him down. Well, when I was I was on uh, Philip, I was on Larry King with Philip Class talking about the Roswell case, and he's pontificating pontificating about the witnesses. Yeah. And I interrupted him and I said, uh, I said, Larry, why don't you ask Philip Class how many of the witnesses he's interviewed? <laughs> and he said none. I uh, thought he'd said one, and I just made a, a face and said, you know, yeah, you yeah. haven't bothered to to research it. Now you're pontificating on 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 the case, so. Uh, but Phil Class could be very charming when he wasn't talking about UFOs and <laughs> was away from yeah. the topic. Well, but, he yes, yes. In fact, I've had an awful lot of conversation with Phil Class. He never once had a conversation with Travis except briefly on Larry King Live, and that was kind of indirect. Most of that was with me. And uh, uh, he never, ever sent a letter or asked or – he never interviewed Travis. Uh, he, he did me extensively. He thought well, I, I was he, a he, he, interviewed, he interviewed Steve Pierce as well. That's right. He's the only other one, and that was to bribe him. 
He, he was trying to to get him to take ten thousand dollars. In fact, he went all the way to Texas to find Steve uh, to make it personal, and still couldn't get him to do it. And then he wrote this thing. In fact, he introduced that on the Larry King Live about you know, this thing, and it, it was completely bogus. He, he took it out of a book that had been written before that by, by Bill Berry, uh, Ultimate Encounter, it was called. And uh, he made the statement that uh, uh, Steve and I had had this conversation wherein uh, I had said, okay, if you're going to take that money, then you're going to be bruised, you know, and all this stuff. But he left out a very vital part of that conversation, which was in, in Bill Berry's book, the whole conversation. And what he left out was, this, even though you know it really happened, you would take the money, and and he left that out. And that totally changed the conversation, totally changed the tone of what he was trying to say. And it was so obvious right there in that book. Well, I know Philip Class has uh, attacked people. He sent letters to their employers trying to get him fired uh, when, when dealing with UFOs and that sort of thing, which I think is just unconscionable. You just shouldn't do that. You, know, you, can you wouldn't, have a dis- yeah, you can you have wouldn't a even know what he did with me. You, you can have a disagreement with somebody. You may not like what their beliefs are, but they're their beliefs. And yeah. you shouldn't try to get them fired because you don't happen to like their beliefs. And I know he did that a number of times. He did that with me in several ways and several big ways. Well, let's uh, – I'm going to have to end this here because we've run out of time. Okay. I will have uh, – we'll be talking to Mike Rogers again real soon. In fact, uh, we'll be coming up with him, I think, in the next – the next program uh, next week. Talk to him a little bit more about the uh, Walton case and Philip Class and that sort of thing. And then we're going to talk about this Phoenix Lights uh, sighting that he had, which I think is very, very interesting. And we should get into that. Uh, Travis, Travis, Mike Rogers had an opportunity to see UFOs on multiple occasions. I saw a light in the sky once. So there you go. Not, not very good. <laughs> um, with the Steve Pierce thing, by the way, uh, I interviewed him in Roswell a couple of times. There's a a couple of blog postings, I believe, at uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com that talks about uh, this incident with Philip Class and, and how that all transpired and what Class was attempting to do there. And I, th- I thought it was very interesting. So you can take a look at that and get some more information about that. Uh, there are some fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Take a look at that, and I'm sure you'll find something that will interest you as well. I always like to point out that um, Roswell in the 21st century should be getting more uh, notice than it does because I think it really kind of puts the whole thing into context, and I think that we need to do more of that. But uh, that's the way things go. I will be back, I guess, again next week with Mike Rogers, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the um, Walton abduction and then the Phoenix Lights. So to put that down on your calendar. Make sure you uh, hear the end of all of this. And uh, thank you for listening. This is A Different Perspective, and I'm Kevin Randall. How would your life change if you could develop the business and personal skills that you need in order to make more money? Do you want to learn how to achieve your big life goals faster? Then go to findhiddenmoney.com and get the Goal For It online course. The course teaches you how you can set and achieve your biggest goals while completely overcoming the roadblocks to your goals so that you can realize your dreams and imagine more success. Go to findhiddenmoney.com. Memorable dynamic presentations are a not-so-secret weapon in the business world. Do you have a powerful message that must be shared, but you haven't found a way to deliver that message? Do you want to be known as a top public speaker who gets amazing results? Are you ready to create and deliver your powerful message? Thomas Hyde can help you create and deliver your speech to get the results you desire. Visit IconQuality.com. Did you expect your business to flourish, but instead it plateaued or didn't get off the ground yet? Would you like to achieve massive goals and discover new sources of income within your business? When you're ready to experience that type of success with fast results, Cindy Hendricks is the business coach for you. 
Her work with entrepreneurs and business owners has been life-changing. To get you and your business where you want to be, go to imaginemoresuccess.com. Has the fear of public speaking stalled your business or personal life? What would you give to develop and maintain supreme confidence? Have an invaluable private program to always perform at your best. Imagine how you would feel. You can have all that and so much more today with Thomas Hyde's life-changing course called Number One Fear Unleashed. Visit NumberOneFear.com and be liberated from your fear of public speaking.